Today's scripture begins with an interesting word, immediately. And it's, it's there because this passage is so tightly connected to the prior one as we've been going through in the book of Matthew, the feeding of the 5,000, or so we call it these days. There was actually quite a bit more people as we covered last week. Um, the disciples there had witnessed a genuine miracle when Jesus multiplied these loaves and fishes in a way that goes beyond words, goes beyond human comprehension how he could do it. And in response to these miracles, the disciples had learned that they could take their problems, whatever they are, even if they are far beyond what is capable in human hands, and place it into his hands. And God can do the impossible once things are in his hands and we're not gripping to it in our own. And in response to this lesson, Jesus now gives them an opportunity to see if they've learned this lesson or a chance to exercise their faith while Jesus goes to spend more time alone with his father as we pick up in verse 22, where just to recap, it says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. Now, did Jesus have to be alone to spend time with God the Father? Of course not. He didn't have to be alone. I mean, 1 Timothy 2 verse 8 instructs people to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. It's not right. Praying isn't something that we have to do on a mountaintop or in secret or anywhere. We can do it literally anywhere. But something happens when you spend one-on-one time with anyone. There's an intimacy there. There's a, there's a, a sweetness, a warmth to that one-on-one time that you don't get when you're in more of a corporate setting like this. Now, that, I mean, that's why I try to go on date nights with my wife. You know, I get to have that one-on-one time with her, have those conversations that are hard to have when there's a hundred other people in the room. And I encourage each of us that we ought to be having that same one-on-one time with God the Father as well. There's a different, different personality. You get, you get to have a different experience with him in private than we do just when we meet with him here in public. That's all I'm saying. But after his time of prayer, it wasn't so easy for Jesus to get back to the disciples, at least in the flesh, as verse 24 says, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Now, by the way, if this whole thing sounds familiar, for those of you who have been following with us through the gospel according to Matthew, it should. I mean, Jesus has calmed a a storm at sea before, just a few chapters before in Matthew chapter 8. But this time, Jesus isn't sleeping in the boat. Jesus is now away on the mountain to pray. But in fact, What's also different is we're not even told that there is necessarily a storm. Did you guys catch that as we read it together? It talks about the wind. It talks about the waves. It doesn't talk about rain. It doesn't talk about thunder. So, And it doesn't say that there isn't either. But what we do know for sure is this strong wind causing this choppy sea. So something to keep in the back of our minds. But what we do know for sure is that the topography of the, of the Sea of Galilee allowed for strong storms to appear very, very quickly. From the high-rise mountains to the north to the very low topography of the sea itself, it allowed for these strong winds to come and create situations that seemingly come out of nowhere as the disciples find themselves in. Now, what's unfortunate for the disciples is that verse 25 mentions they're in the fourth watch of the night, which means it's somewhere around three hours before sunrise. Now, that's a terrifying thought when you consider verse 23 that says that they set sail at sunset. So they probably spent somewhere close to nine hours on this horrible boat ride. Could you imagine that? Imagine how discouraging that must be. No, I can't help but to imagine that by this time, the disciples must have been exhausted, cold, wet, and in a state of despair after being out there in such horrible conditions for so long. And I imagine they might have been asking, where is Jesus in all of this? 
it wouldn't be this bad if Jesus were here. Why did he send us into these waters alone? Doesn't he care about what's happening to us out here on these waters? And I have a question for you guys in response. Do you guys think that this storm surprised Jesus? You think he didn't know that this storm, this windstorm was going to take place? Because if you don't think so, then we are not talking about the same Jesus that I'm talking about. Your Jesus might be too small for my likings. Because I believe God purposely sends us into storms like this from time to time. And, or into trials or troubled waters of, if you will, so that we can learn something about God or something about ourselves that we wouldn't have learned any other way but through that trial. This is something I need to remind myself of constantly. I actually have this painting in my home office that says that calm seas have never produced a skilled sailor. That's something to keep in mind as we go through times. God is trying to teach us something, to make us stronger, to learn something about him or about ourselves that we need to learn. But the problem is we too often don't think like that, do we? Too often we, as we find ourselves in these trials, we find ourselves saying things like, why would God allow this to happen? I don't deserve this. No, if God knew what he was doing, then he wouldn't have allowed this to happen to me. Or similar things. What we're really saying is, I don't deserve this. God clearly made a mistake. We deserve better than this. We deserve leisure and easy times. That's what we not, we're not saying it with our mouths, but our hearts sure are saying that, aren't we? When we go, when that's what we're feeling. And we need to really get an attitude correction for that. Guys, we got to remember every day that we don't wake up in hell is by God's mercy. It's by God's grace that that doesn't happen. What did, what did God tell Adam and Eve way back in the garden? The day you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. Every day since then that that hasn't happened, that God has withheld judgment in order to show mercy, that is exactly what we have received, his mercy and grace. But furthermore, we're never promised to have an easy experience in this life in the first place. 2 Timothy 3.12 goes on to say that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. What does that mean? It means we are going to have hard times. It means we should expect hard times in this life. But it's not all doom and gloom. Romans 8.18 tells us, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed in us. Now that's great news. It's saying, look, you're going to go through some hard times. This life is not promised to be easy. But what God does promise us is it's worth it. That what's waiting for us on the other side, it's not. It's so wonderful, so glorious that it's not even fair to compare the troubles that we're going to go through on this side of eternity to what we're going to enjoy in God's perfect presence in the next. That's good news. Yes, as we go through our own trials, As we go through our own Jesus, where is Jesus in my suffering moments? We ought not think like something strange is happening to us or that God has somehow forgotten about us. I assure you he hasn't. We're going to see that in the rest of this text we're going to unpack today. But what I'm saying is do not be surprised if Jesus shows up in a powerful and unexpected way in your trial. Because that's certainly what happens to the apostles as we jump back in verse 25, as Jesus shows up in quite an alarming way to his apostles. Where it says, and in the fourth watch of the night, again, about three hours till sunrise, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Why on earth would they think that Jesus was a ghost? That's a good question. You know, the Bible does affirm the existence of other spirits, even evil spirits, but never specifically ghosts. Where did this idea come from? Well, it actually came from the Greco-Roman culture that they were surrounded by. 
It didn't come from Jewish culture. It didn't come from scriptures. But it did come from the Roman Greco culture that they were in. Because they believed that ghosts were warning signs of impending doom at that time. And perhaps they believed that with the strength of this windstorm, maybe they were starting to believe that this was to be their end which is a subtle reminder to the rest of us that as we believe things beyond the realm of this physical life, these things that we can touch and feel, we need to make sure we're getting our truth from the right source. Otherwise, we might end up believing in rather odd things. But alas, it was not to be their end as they received the most comforting word they could hear in verse 27. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, there's nothing like hearing a familiar voice when you're in trouble, is it? Someone saying, it's going to be okay. I'm here now. It's going to be all right. Comforting words. And so at this point, all of their fears and lingering doubts should have vanished, right? I mean, after all, Jesus is there. What could possibly go wrong? Well, let's see what happens in verse 28. And Peter answered him saying, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. And I have to make a confession to you guys. Look, people have the impression that pastors have all the answers. I certainly don't. I do my best to search for them, and often there are. But I have no idea why Peter got out of the boat. Why would he, what would motivate him to do that? I really racked my brain on this, and maybe it's because he truly believed in his heart. Look, I know it makes no sense to go out there, but I know wherever Jesus is is going to be safer than being in the known. I know it's safer for me to stay in the boat, but if Jesus is out there, that's where I'm going. And maybe that's true, maybe it's not. I don't know. But I do know one thing with absolute certainty. Only Peter could have done this. If you've been follow, if you know anything about the New Testament, if you know anything about the disciples, you know that Peter seems to be born with this condition where there is no delay between his mind and his mouth. As soon as he thinks it, he immediately does it. As soon as he has that idea, immediately he starts doing it. Perhaps you guys know somebody like that too. But what I find so interesting, though, is that despite this impulsivity, this thing that doesn't make sense, something that 2,000 years later, I still can't make sense of it. Jesus doesn't chide Peter about this request. Did you guys notice that? He doesn't say, oh, that's too big of a request. Peter, what are you doing? No, he, he, he says, come. The only thing he chides was Peter's lack of faith in a few minutes. Which reminds us, there is no request that is too big for God. We forget this sometimes. When we want to lay the requests of our heart out to our Heavenly Father, we were like, oh, I don't really want to burden Him with this, or this is going to be too hard for Him to do. I don't really want to ask for too much. But if God really is who the Bible says He is, if God is infinitely powerful, infinitely loving, infinitely wise, there's nothing you can ask for that's too hard for Him. That's very good news for us today. So we ought not be surprised when God says yes, even to our big prayers. Because the the huge prayers and the seemingly easy prayers, they're the same to our Heavenly Father. (laughs) And I wonder how often we miss out because we don't ask God for those big things. Because we, we don't take those big issues that are on our hearts those big trials and temptations that we are going through and truly hand them over to God. I wonder how much we miss out on. So after all, James even tells us we do not have because we do not ask. There's something to be said of that. But unfortunately for our good buddy Pete, this isn't the end of his story. As verse 30 continues, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, 
Why did you doubt? Now, it would be so easy for us to kind of laugh at Peter at this point. It's so easy to say, well, why, did you, why didn't you believe? Jesus is right there. What could possibly happen? Jesus is here. But I haven't seen any of you guys walking on water. I don't think so, have I? No, I don't think any of us have found ourselves literally doing the impossible. I mean, we've all gone through things where we've experienced God's providence or God's touch or God's perfect timing in amazing ways. I'm looking around this room. I've seen, I know some of you have some pretty amazing stories, but we've never walked on water or done the literally impossible like this. So we ought to withhold a little bit of judgment for grace for this guy. Unless I'm mistaken, if any of you have walked on water, I'll let you finish the sermon. But that being said, his faith, however, was incomplete. It's not that he didn't have faith. It was incomplete, I like to call it. Something about this wind made him fearful despite Jesus being right there and him having no rational reason to be afraid. You know, the lesson of the, fi- of the feeding of the 5,000 was still not completely learned. As it appears, he, he doubted. And he seems to believe that his problems were somehow bigger than Jesus was able to save at that time. That he had bigger problems than Jesus was able to save him from. He still had to learn who it was who was walking out on the water with him. Now at this point, the application seems pretty simple, doesn't it? Seems obvious. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep the faith, muster up your faith, stay focused on Jesus, and you too will be walking on the waters. Perhaps in a spiritual or metaphorical sense. But yes, learn to, learn to walk on water by keeping your eyes on Jesus. And there's, there's something to be said of that. Life is better when you have your focus on Jesus, when you trust the one who's at the helm of our lives. I heard a great illustration a number of years ago that if you get on an airplane, how you care, your confidence in the pilot doesn't make a difference with how well the pilot will fly the plane. So whether you are, re- whether you are relaxed and enjoying the ride or fearful that you're going to crash, what's going to happen is going to happen. The pilot's capable whether or not you think he is or not. And it's the same way with our relationship with God. He, he's, he's given us no reason to be fearful. He's at the helm. He has all things under his control. We have no reason to worry. And there's something to be said of that, that there, we ought to keep our eyes on him and find our peace. But while maybe some of you needed to hear that this morning and have that encouragement, that's not the main point of this text. That's not why this is recorded in Holy Scripture. Because the point here isn't to learn how you too can walk on water. Zero people since this day have done this. So that's not what's going on here. In fact, Peter's not even the main character of this narrative. Who is? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He changed everything about this storm when he showed up in it. They were perishing on the, on the waters, making no headway, and Jesus shows up, gets on the boat, and the wind ceases. Everything changes when Jesus shows up. Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, he starts sinking, but Peter never took his eyes off, but Jesus never took his eyes off of Peter. Jesus wasn't surprised by the wind. He, he sent them into the wind. He wasn't deterred by the storm. He walked right through this storm to reach his people. That's how great and awesome and loving and willing to reach his people our God is. And here's what ought to be our takeaway. If you get nothing out of this sermon, I hope you get this. That our takeaway, what we really are in this passage, we're all Peters. Not when he's walking on water, but when he's sinking. Because we all sin. We all take our eyes off of Jesus. We're all, we're certainly for us who are Christians, we all at least at one point were, were perishing, helpless in our sins, in a situation we couldn't get ourselves out of by our own works. Does that sound familiar to some of you guys? That kind of sounds like our testimony. Romans 3.23 tells us that the wages of our sins, which we have all done, 
which we're all sinners. We don't have to have doctrines like original sin to prove that we're sinners. We all have done things that we regret. We've all done things that are displeasing to God. Every one of us, including myself. And Romans 3.23, that those wages for those sins is death. That is what we deserve. But I'm grateful that that's not the end of that verse. That verse concludes by saying, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So hear this, guys. The most important thing Peter did in this passage wasn't having a strong faith. It wasn't keeping his eyes perfectly fixed on Jesus. The most important thing Peter did was what, how he responded when he took his eyes off of Jesus, which was to cry out in his desperation when there was nothing more for him to do, when his strength has failed him, was to call out, Lord, save me. That was the most important thing Peter ever did in his life, perhaps. Because it's not about you having enough faith. It's not about you becoming the hero of your own story. It's realizing Jesus is the hero. It's not about having enough faith to walk on water. It's having what little faith we do have in the one who has walked on water. Do you hear the difference? It's important. Because it's not your faith. It's not your works. It's looking to Jesus to save you. And what does Jesus do in response to his call? Immediately. He didn't hesitate for a second. Immediately. He reached out his hand and took hold of him. I love this. I love this passage so much for that reason. Because when you falter, not if, when you falter, because we all do, if you call upon his name, Jesus will rescue you. He will restore you. There may be consequences to your actions. I mean, I'm sure when P Jesus pulled Peter out of the water, I'm sure the guy was still wet. And I'm sure as God pulls us up from the muck of our own sins, there's a, there's a period of cleaning up that he's got to do. I'm still going through mine. We all are. None of us are, have, received, have reached the other side of eternity yet. But when you call upon his name and you turn from your sins and you turn to him, believing in what he did on the cross for you, taking all of your sins, past, present, and future upon himself. If you believe he did that for you and you turn from your own sins, the Bible says you have been forgiven every sin you've ever committed and ever will commit. There's no greater news than this. Have you called upon the Lord the way Peter did? Because he's willing to save you too. Jesus even asks Peter, why did you doubt? Because Jesus has never given us a reason to doubt him. All of his word is a promise that he will do exactly this. Now, I don't know what Jesus you believe in this morning, but the Jesus of the Bible is strong enough to save, able to save, and most importantly, willing to save us. I mean, in fact, as a verse most of you might be familiar with, whether you come to church regularly or not, it begins with saying, for God so loved the world. Now, you're all in the world today this morning, right? Good, then this passage applies to you. <laughs> Just had to be sure. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, whatever believes in what he did on the cross, taking your sins and shame upon himself so that we need not bear them anymore, shall not perish. We all know what that means. But have everlasting life. So how are we to respond to these truths these mornings? Yes, Pastor, you're talking, but what are, we, what are we supposed to respond with that today? Well, verse 32 tells us, And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The proper response to who Jesus is and what he has done to you 
It's to declare him to be who the Bible says he is, the son of God, and to worship him, to respond in praise and worship to our God. And it's fascinating because, remember, this is the second storm at the sea, if you will, that Jesus has calmed. The first time back in chapter 8, the disciples asked among themselves, what sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? They were overwhelmed by what they had experienced in Christ. And they finally know, they finally have what's known as a clue who's in the boat with them. And they move beyond their questioning and begin to worship him for who he is, the son of God, the savior, the one who come to take away the sins of the world. And guys, look, there's a, there's a time for observations of Christ. There's a time for questioning who he is. I love questions. I live my life asking questions. And what's great about questions is is if you ask questions, you get answers. It's fascinating. There's a cause and effect relationship with those. So yeah, while we invite good questions, and I still do my best to ask questions, is that's how I learn even more about scripture. But there's a time to make a decision too. There's a time where each one of us has to make a decision of what we're going to do about Jesus. Are we going to ignore him and reject him as the Pharisees already had in the preceding chapters? Or are we going to do what the apostles did this morning and worship him, declaring him to be worthy of our praise, declaring that he is the son of God? So if you haven't done so already, I implore you, Call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of Jesus this morning. Recognize, as so many others here have done, recognize that we are sinners, lost at sea without Jesus. Not a chance, not a prayer of getting out in our own strength, but looking to him, turning from our sins and calling upon his name, using the same words Peter did. Lord, save me. Thanks be to God. Amen.